All right, so microdosing is a topic that has gotten pretty controversial these last couple of years. We are both seeing a big market, a lot of companies starting up with the perfect microdosing solution, right? And you also have some scientific studies showing some real good effects of microdosing. And you have proponents like Paul Stamets and James Fadiman who both think microdosing is an important tool. On the other hand, you have uh, a group of researchers at Imperial College London and they found contradictory results to what you might believe. They found that the placebo effects and expectations effects uh, are actually uh, the driving force, at least in this study, in this sample. So at the conference I got an opportunity to talk to Bala Segeti, who is one of the researchers behind this study at Imperial College London. And he will talk a little bit about the results from the study, what conclusions they have drawn from it, and also what he thinks about microdosing in general now after the study is done. Enjoy! Tell us a little bit about your research in, on microdosing, please. Yeah, so um, the trial that we did at Imperial College is a unique citizen science initiative. We call it the self-blinding microdose study. And what was unique about it, that it was not your traditional randomized controlled trial, rather we developed a methodology how people at home can implement their own placebo control. And the great advantage of this approach is that A, it's much cheaper than a randomized clinical trial, but also because it's global reach, we managed to have a much larger sample size than any other study. Indeed, our study is by far the largest placebo-controlled study on uh, microdosing. Mm. And what did you find? Uh, it's a complicated question, but I will try to summarize it quickly. So, if you are looking at the long-term outcome, so what happens after uh, um, microdosing or taking placebos for uh, four weeks, then what we have found is that people in the microdose group consistently across the outcome saw so measures such as uh, psychological well-being, uh, connectedness, life satisfaction, they have statistically significantly improved relative to their baseline in the microdose group. However, there was no statistically significant between treatment difference, so they did not improve more than people in the placebo control condition. So I think, you know, what's important here to emphasize that our results do not mean that microdosing does not have positive effects. We very clearly show that across a range of measures, there was a significant effect. It's just that that effect happens to be not larger than the, than the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. The other side of the outcomes is when we zoom, on, zoom in on uh, shorter time scales. So what happens acutely two to six hours after a capsule is taken, um, and what we have found is, is that there were some very small placebo microdose differences that were statistically significant, favoring the microdose condition. However, these effects were genuinely very small. So the, the way I like to explain it is that let's say that you want to lose uh, weight and you take a drug for that. If that drug makes you lose, let's say, half a kilo, that can be statistically significant, but for sure it does not have any practical implications because half a kilo is too small of a difference for it to be meaningful. Mm. So that's the sort of effect size that we have found with microdosing. And the other important caveat here, of course, is that the blinding was uh, compromised, like practically in all other psychedelic studies as well. And, mm. and that's not straightforward how we incorporate that information into the analysis of the trial. We are developing statistical methods to do that. And when we run these more sophisticated versions of the analysis, when we adjust the trial results for the quality of the blinding, then we see that even these small effect sizes go away with one exception, and that one exception is, is self-perceived energy levels. Recently, there was a traditional RCT coming out from New Zealand on microdosing, and they used a, a very different analytical approach, but they've also found that self-perceived energy levels increase beyond what's explainable by expectancy. So taken there and our results taken together, I do believe that microdosing has a small but true effect on um, a true stimulatory effect, uh, which is not explainable uh, by expectancy and placebo effects. It's very interesting. So do you see any possibility that there might be a synergistic effect between expectations and actually taking a microdose? So statistically speaking, no. So like we don't see um, an interaction effect as, 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 as we would be testing it. We, 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 we were looking for it, but we did not find it. Right, right. Okay, exciting. And uh, what do you think, what do you have to say to James Fadiman and Paul Stamets, which are uh, profiles that really are proponents for microdosing? I think, you know, if you look at what we have found and what they are saying, they are perfectly compatible. 
And the reason why they are perfectly compatible is what I started um, with is that what we are saying is not that there are no effects, it's just that the effects are not larger than the placebo effect. So if people are microdosing at home, what they are experiencing, what we are calling the change over time, they're not experiencing the difference between the placebo treatment and the microdose treatment, right? So that's what I'm saying is that there is no contradiction. If anything, what we have shown in our results is that uh, indeed microdosing has benefits, as I have said before, in, in those long-term outcomes. Because, and that's what microdosers are experiencing. It is just that you can get the same sort of effects by taking placebos. Mm. But I see no contradiction. We, we disagree maybe on the mechanism behind that effect, but I do, not, uh, I, I do agree with them that there is an effect. But, you know, what needs to be said here is that it's, you know, you, with other interventions in a placebo control trial, you could elicit an effect like that if it's driven by the me uh, placebo mechanism. Right, right. Or uh, snake poison, but they have said there. <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't go that far. And as I said, I do believe microdosing has a true stimulatory effect. So I do, I, I am I'm skeptical about the effects on um, mood in particular. And it, when it comes to claims related to creativity and workplace focus. But I, I, I think there is strong evidence, even for somebody who is strongly skeptic like me, that there is a true um, stimulatory effect. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And one final question for you. Where do you see the field of psychedelic research in 20 years? Um, so I think like, you know, the, the long term outcome here, I kind of feel like, you know, that what we are discussing here and what is the vibe at this conference, there's a little bit of a positivity overload. It feels like to me that down the line, like, you know, probably psychedelic medication will not be able to solve as much problems as, you know, often discussed here. But that being said, based on the research that we know today, I would be surprised if psychedelics overall would not have a positive effect on mental health treatment. I think what's exciting here is that it's a completely new class of drugs. So it's, it's just another tool to the toolkit of psychiatry that we can help patients with. And it's not going to work for everybody, but it is going to be good that, let's say, if you are depressed, we can try SSRIs for you. If it doesn't work, we can try psilocybin and hope that you're going to respond to either of these treatment options. That's certainly better than just being able to try one of the treatment mm -hmm. options. All right. Thank you so much, Balas. Thank you for having me. Cool.